one of the things that is becoming increasingly important in reach the recent times, as well as increasingly important in large organisations, is what's referred to as corporate governance. Now, if you remember, during the course, again, what we did was we started with recruiting and selecting one person, made it bigger into a team, made it bigger into a department, and what the sort of things we've been looking at in the last couple of chapters included things like how are you going to put the organisation together. Now, corporate governance is something that's going to become a very, very big deal in later papers. F8, P1, P7, a little bit of P3. Corporate governance becomes a big deal. Corporate governance is all to do with how do the people at the top of the company make sure that everybody is actually doing what they are supposed to. So it's all very well saying we have got a structure. Here are the people at the top, then we've got some middle managers, then we've got some junior managers, and then we've got some workers. But how do we know that everybody is actually doing their job properly to make sure that the company is performing as well as it's supposed to? So corporate governance is all to do with the way that companies get run. So it says here, on page 123, that corporate governance is the systems by which organisations are directed and controlled. In other words, what corporate governance is all to do with is making sure people are doing what they're supposed to. And the reason it's needed is because shareholders own the company, but directors actually run the company. So, for example, I am a shareholder in a few small companies. I own shares in about five or six companies. I don't know what they do with my money. They've never phoned me up and asked me. I have to trust them. I have to trust that the company is spending my money wisely to try and make profits for the future so that I will be better off. Corporate governance is how I know that I can trust them. They follow a set of guidelines, and if they follow those guidelines, then it means that they are always thinking what could for me and the other shareholders, as well as just thinking what's good for the directors themselves. So corporate governance makes them think about me. Now, corporate governance is not that old. It hasn't been around for that long. So 30 years ago, the directors could pay themselves big bonuses, give themselves lots of perks, lots of extra benefits, and the shareholders couldn't do anything about it. At least now, Corporate governance is something that becomes part of the audit. So it means that if they're not behaving properly, at least I know about it. And then I can perhaps try and get rid of those directors. So the principles of corporate, uh, corporate governance, the OECD, which is like a multinational um, committee all to do with economic development, basically says there are five rules that we need to think about, five principles, shareholders have various rights, and so we must recognise what they are. So we've always got to think that the shareholders have the right to know what the company's doing with their money. Underneath that, all shareholders should be treated the same. In other words, if a big institutional shareholder, a pension fund that owns a lots of shares, is told something, then everybody else ought to be treated the same way. I might only hold five shares in a company. But I still should deserve to be treated the same way as somebody who owns five million. If they get told something, I should get told it as well. Stakeholder relations. What we're talking about there is that we, are, we should deal with everybody properly. We should pay our suppliers on time. We should make sure that our customers are treated properly. We should treat our employees fairly. All of these are key issues as far as corporate governance is concerned. It's not just about shareholders. Disclosure, transparency. Both of those simply mean, again, that the outside world should know what's going on. Now, they're not talking about knowing what the company's going to do next, because that would be confidential. But what they are saying is knowing that the company is being run properly, not trying to hide anything from the shareholders not trying to hide anything from regulators. So making sure that people who invest in the company actually know what's going on. Final one there, 
the board. All of this comes back to the board of directors. It's up to them to make sure that they are doing this properly. So if there is corporate governance that is not being done properly, it's the board of directors who are at fault. So we need to make sure, the board rather, needs to make sure that they understand what these rules are and then they follow them. So guidance on corporate governance. You can see here all companies that are listed have to make sure that they follow these. There is what's called the combined code, which is the set of rules that they have to follow. Overseas companies, again, have to say how they're going to meet all these guidelines that are in the combined code. It says that they are general principles. Listed companies, how they have applied the code. So it's not a set of rules that have to be followed. It's a set of principles you should follow this. Good corporate governance would mean that you do this. You don't have to follow them, but normally one of the things that will be looked at in the audit is if you're not following them, you'll need to justify why you're not following them. So good corporate governance, you should do this. If you're doing that, you need to say why. And then the shareholders can decide if they feel that's a good enough excuse. If they do, then fine. If they don't, well, you may have a problem. So, a key issue you can see there is one to do with balance. Non-executive directors are a very big deal. One of the biggest things that corporate governance has talked about over the last few years is the rise of a non-executive director. A non-executive director is somebody who does not actually work for the company. They are paid by the company, but they're not a full-time employee. We'll talk about that on the next page. Underneath that, the chairman and the chief executive should not be the same person. The idea behind that is that the chairman is the chairman of the board of directors. The chief executive is the person who runs the company. They should be different. And the reason is, if they're not different, if they're the same person, the chief executive can do whatever they like. Because the board of directors are there to see what the chief executive does. In effect, to make sure the chief executive is not doing anything wrong. If the same person is in charge of the board of directors, in effect, there's nobody to check that this person isn't doing anything wrong. So they, should be the, they shouldn't be the same person. They should be different people. Again, there are a number of companies in the UK that actually break that guideline. In their audit report, they need to say why. And then the shareholders can see if they feel that's an adequate excuse. So, executive directors, full-time. They work for a company, the marketing director, the finance director. These people will be paid by the company. Now, the trouble is that there will be a temptation for them to do what's best for themselves. Non-executive directors are not full-time. Therefore, they should be more independent. That means that they can look at something that the directors are doing and say, why are you doing that? Is it really for the best interests of the shareholders? It's easier for them to do that because they don't work full time for the company. That's the idea. So non-executive directors. It says here at least half of the board of directors should be non-executive. In other words, it means they can outvote the executive director. So if they're really unhappy with something, they can outvote the people who work for the company. And that's a very important check to make sure that the people who work for the company, the executive directors, don't try and do things that simply benefit themselves. Now, various principles when you're thinking about non-executive directors. They should have some kind of expertise in the industry, so they ought to know what they're talking about. It should be that they act as the corporate conscience. Remember, they are not so directly involved in what the company does, so it's up to them to say, that's a bad idea. We shouldn't do that because it's bad for the customers. We shouldn't do that because it's bad for the employees. They're there to make sure the company doesn't do things that it shouldn't do. Down at the bottom, we've got two comp committees that are particularly mentioned, remuneration and audit. The remuneration committee sets the pay of the directors, the executive directors. 
Now, obviously, if they are all the executive directors, they can give themselves massive, great big pay rises and nobody will be able to do anything about it. So the idea behind having non-executive directors on that particular group is so that they, again, will act as a check. Are you really going to give somebody a massive pay rise? Do you really need to? So it says here at least three people, preferably, again, a majority. So do we really need to give people all these pay rises? The audit committee is very important because the audit committee is who appoints the external auditors. Now, the external auditors are the people who come along and say the company's being run properly and the financial statements are OK. One of their main things that they do is to say the financial statements are reasonably accurate. You may know from F3, you certainly will know by the time you do F8, that it's not the auditor's job to say the financial statements are completely accurate, because you could never do that. Whenever you've got a provision of some kind, you never know it's going to be completely accurate. But they are there to say it's reasonably accurate. Now, of course, the thing is, that means that they have to question the directors of a company and ask why they've done something. If the directors don't like the questions that they are being asked, they might decide to get rid of the auditor. The non-executive directors are there to stop that. They are there to say, look, it's their job to ask difficult questions. One of the other things that the audit committee will do is they'll have the internal auditors report to them. An internal audit is something we'll talk about later in the course. So that's a very, very important committee. It makes sure things are being done in the right way. So that's why you want a lot of non-executive directors on there. So again, make it independent. Final bit that we have in this particular section talks about social responsibility. Social responsibility simply means that we have to think about our impact on society. Social responsibility means that a company is not just interested in profits. It's interested perhaps in doing things that at least do not damage the local community. So corporate social responsibility, making sure you don't pollute water, air, anything like that. Corporate social responsibility would be looking at the products that we aim to offer. Perhaps withdrawing some because they're not particularly safe and perhaps promoting other ones because they are safer. Corporate social responsibility, should we do the absolute minimum health and safety that we have to by law, or should we spend a bit more to make sure that there is virtually no chance that our employees will be injured doing something? Corporate social responsibility is not necessarily a legal thing. So it may not be something a company has to do, it may be something a company chooses to do. Why might they choose to do? Because if they are if they are looking at things in a social responsible way, notice what it says there, adverse impact on short-term profits. In other words, it costs more in the short term, but in the long term, many consumers, many customers like to deal with companies that are socially responsible. Now, there are a number of examples of this. Probably the most commonly used example, at least up till a few years ago in the UK, was a company called The Body Shop. The Body Shop got a very strong, got a very strong reputation for social responsibility because they did things like making sure that none of their products were tested on animals, making sure that the raw materials that they used, they paid a fair price to. They were a big company. A lot of their supplies were small. They could have made sure that they paid the absolute minimum. They could have done that because they were a big customer. They could have made sure that they always delayed payments to these suppliers. They did the opposite. They made sure that they paid a reasonable amount and they made sure they paid it on time. They didn't have to do either of those things, but they did to be a good corporate citizen, to try and help other companies. And one of the reasons why Body Shop have been successful is because of that. They've got a very good reputation. So in the short term, it costs them. In the long term, it's almost like marketing. So corporate social responsibility is all to do with the way companies act. Corporate governance is making sure that the directors do things in the right way. 